part on the two ayat. Yeah, exactly. We're not going to give up, get off track. We already got off track with for almost half an hour right now. No but that's okay. I mean, it's time for Palestine, though. There, there you go. It's exactly. So let's continue right here. Wala tankihu manak haaba ukum min al nisa'i illa ma qad sar. Yeah, yeah. You, you, when whenever it says live over here, that means that we're recording. Okay. Yeah, so we're good. Okay. Um, so of course we're still in the part about marriage and speaking about the different um the different things in relationship to marriage. So before it was basically talking about bring a ban. Um, and since it was talking about inheritance, it was basically ending uh, the extension that the Arab had been living in, which is to ab avoid women from having their financial slash inheritance rights because they considered them as property. So Islam wanted to say, well, let me speak about that because women are not property and therefore we should emphasize um, in this area that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was basically giving women the right to choose marriage, the right to actually deny or reject a particular marriage, even if the wali were to abuse their power and force a woman to get married to someone or prevent her from getting married to someone. And of course, when we're talking about prevent her from getting married to someone, someone that is not qualified um, not a qualified to for her to get married to or actually qualified um, to get married. Sorry, the other way around. Uh, someone qualified. So Islam was basically right there starting uh, to emphasize uh, women's rights. And of course, this is, you know, in the lens of Surah an nisa exposing that women would basically have the right to ashiruhunna bil ma'roof. They would have the right to be dealt and treated in ma'roof, whether that is with justice or through the lens of the society, we would also consider justice. So culture plays, plays an important role in identifying justice. Now, that's a very important thing to mention because there are certain things that we would go back to the resource that's called the manqul. What is the manqul? The manqul would actually be the text. So certain texts, they would be our basis to identify what it means to do justice, what it means to do what's right. How do we identify people's rights and so forth? So we would go for the manqul, which basically is the text. The the other type of reference is basically you got il ma'qul, which is the logic. And sometimes when you look at the logic, we could, yes, we might actually understand the different philosophy of ethics. Are we going to base it based on the consequence? How, do, how much do we necessarily consider, consider the universal imperialism and all these different ideas, the different philosophies and what makes something as ethical and what makes something not ethical? But in situations where we don't have a text to define for us whether this is a woman's right or not. We can go back to the culture. Whatever or or where culture itself can actually be a place of reference to help us identify what is considered as the foundation for treating and giving women their rights. So when you look at Ashur, but here's one thing, if the culture would actually contradict the legal maxims of Islam, that would automatically be rejected. If, it, if the culture, if anything in the culture, let's say in the culture, it says it considers that it's okay for the father to force his daughter to get married to an oiri, let's say she's 13 years old, and in the culture, it's actually okay to get his 13-year-old daughter getting to get married to probably an 80-year-old man, okay? If this is the culture, we won't necessarily necessarily use that as a reference so in our times we would consider the different factors in making sure that this is in the for in the interest for the daughter okay 
we would consider the daughters in the, the women's interest as the main as the main center before we would even consider any law. So the judge and even the government in Islam would basically consider the different rights for the vulnerable and women to be the priority of in place of support because they don't usually have the voice. So the Prophet ﷺ was really as you could see in the Quran, was always in support of the vulnerable, just like in Aytam, just like in Surah An-Nisa, in where it was talking about the vulnerable, the, the orphans first, the women, the, the children, and so forth, as considering them, their voices, and their needs must be considered as the priority. And of course, once it basically talked about the women's rights in terms of having the right to be treated with, with fairness, to be given justice, and of course, to be given um, to be given the different needs as in support for the di their different needs based on what is known at that time. That time, so right here, exactly like the story in where we would consider the 13-year-old getting married to an 80-year-old man, we would, we would basically support that, no, this should not be something that the government should allow simply because we would look at the situation that we're living in today which is the different needs and necessities that a woman might need her life her physical needs her biological uh, creation the reality is that with a big age group the life expectancy of an 80 year old man is totally different than life expectancy of a 13 year old girl and of course with children etc and of course financing etc so with in that situation, we would basically have to advocate for this young girl's life because even in the times that we're living in, the necessities are totally different. So we would look at Al Ma'roof right there to explain the Ma'roof during our times. The contemporary times are not at all like the times during uh, during the time of the Prophet. We would consider that. There is a quote. لا ينكر تغير الأحكام بتغير الأزمان. لا ينكر تغير الأحكام بتغير الأزمان. I want to stop at this quote for just a bit. What does it mean? That there is no denial that certain rulings would basically change in, in accordance to the changes of different times in history. In other words, we would have laws, Islamic laws, changing whenever we would see the circumstances during that point of history changing. Yet, this does not include changing what is mansus, what is already in a text. Why? Because lejtihada fi mawrid nas. There is no ijtihad, there is no analogy, there is no change in the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already pointed and given as a text in the Quran or Sunnah. What laws are we talking about? The laws that are ijtihadi, the laws that are ijtihadi. What is ijtihadi? Ijtihadi actually means that there are certain laws in Islam, whether it's the Hanafi madhab, Maliki madhab, etc., that they might have actually um, had mentioned due to probably their analogy of the situation or analogy um, during that time. So basically, said the Dara'ah, maybe. Um, uh, ending the different uh, the different routes that lead to evil, etc. So then they would look at those situations. So that actually was a result of an analogy. Whatever is an, a result of an analogy, give you an idea or an example for the Maliki Madhab. Pay attention to this one. The Malikis had emphasized that it is not permissible for a father or even a male relative, whether it's a brother, a father, etc., to actually change or even see the aura of a three-year-old girl. Even if it's three years old, you might say, well, Malikis, where is there a text 
that would actually say that. And they would tell you, well, what we had actually received is a lot of information and some cases in where little girls were actually molested or at least mistreated even from their own relatives. So we need to put we need to right there once we see an increase in the statistics of young girls being molested, then in that situation, we would basically say that in the legal maxim in Islam, the protection of the daughters, the protection of young kids, and making sure that somebody with an ill intention does not get access, we would basically say, well, it would be hard on for you to get access. So we don't want to touching, even if it were a diaper change, et cetera, we would have the mom just do it. Very good point of view. You see it right there? Now, when you look at such analogies, such ishtihad, looking at the situation, why? Because when you look at fuqa, it's all about understanding the reason and the motive behind the different rules and laws. This is extremely important. Let me give you an idea. You got this phone. This phone is right here. Phone fell. Islam will tell you, yes, the phone fell, but we would like to prevent what cause the phone from falling and not start putting different ways of keeping the phone on the table. Are you guys with me here? The different way of solving problems between Islam and the West is simply that. A Western mind in understanding ethics would say, well, we still want to support people's freedom and we'll say, let's put different regulations, let's give people freedom, and it becomes that freedom itself is actually more of a rhetoric, let's just support it, just a, even if it starts bringing in the wrong consequences. So in order to prevent the phone from falling, well, let's put, a, uh, let's put something right here. Maybe we could start taping it, maybe start putting this, because they would consider that the sanctity is actually for what? That the sanctity is actually for freedom. Islam considers that the sanctity is for the preservation and the protection of one, justice in for people's deen, two, for people's lives, three, for people's minds, four, for people's family and chastity, and five, for people's wealth. So Islam will be telling you, listen, I want to make sure that before we start trying to figure out the different policies and regulations to put to protect the phone from falling as the you know, hypothetical question here, Islam will tell you, no, let's figure out the motives and know and expose the motives from having the phone fall out, for example, and that way we would reduce from putting in more and more regulations. Let's uproot the main cause and that way you won't spend so much money in trying to maintain the phone on the table. You will maintain the phone on the table, you know, in this situation, you will maintain it with less money if you were to actually regulate the policies in the in the basis in the basis in the beginning of it like let's, let's give something even more practical look at the right now this is the, what is costing the government to pay for single parents how much money is actually being paid for single parents and right now the government is even paying for abortion what's happening well, right, the, the, the situation could actually be, and of course, the way that it's actually being portrayed by the feminists right now is that it's basically giving women opportunities or it's basically helping women to survive. We're subsidizing abortion in order to help others survive. So you're killing to help someone else survive? Look at the, look at the contradiction. Look at the whole discrepancy you're killing someone in order to have someone else survive. Why don't we have both of them survive? How about that? 
why don't we have both of them survive? So how can we do that? So the Western idea is that, well, let's just give people the freedom to sexuality, the freedom to choose their partner, et cetera. And then what you end up with is basically the government trying to figure out what they did not want to sanction in the beginning, which is, well, let's make sure that we are encouraging people to get married and making sure that we basically would sanction the, for example, the immodesty and the, the wrong behaviors or even the media that is fueling all the different things that is causing people to go in such craze, in such craze of lust. But of course, what you could see right now is that, no, we're funding more of trying to put in the different things to protect. Right now, to protect the children, to protect the women, to protect this. But in reality, it's actually not protecting the women. It's not protecting the children. And it's not protecting their rights. And what we're seeing is more and more victims of single parents, victims of children with mental illnesses, victims, and the list goes on and on. You see the difference? So when Islam considers when you want to judge and rule something, it's actually an extension to how you see and how you scrutinize the main motives behind the case and what's actually the, the circumstances that are surrounding the case. This is what fiqh is. Fiqh is not a silent text. Fiqh actually contains deep analogies, deep thoughts, deep what is the word? It, now I'm starting to get into my fiqh. You're like, wait a minute, I was supposed to go into tafsir. Sorry, ladies. You know, I once I start getting into that fiqh mode, you could see I start getting so hyper. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, I'm actually specialized in fiqh. <laughs> All right, I get into that. And this is extremely important to analyze. Islam's laws are not silent slash rigid laws. Islam's laws are not rigid. In fact, Islam's laws go deep to the cause of the problem. Islam's laws are there to protect people's justices, are there to protect people's rights from the root, whether we're talking about Muslims or whether we're talking about all of mankind internationally. You know why? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hatta yakuna deen. What? Why? How? Said, well, once they would recognize the discrepancies of how their policies had brought in more and more injustice, once they would say how your laws, how Islam's laws had brought in a solution to the different injustices, whether we're talking about family, whether we're talking about economy, whether we're talking about policies, the foreign policies, international policies, internal policies, whatever it is, once they see that applied, that's when they will adopt and have no alternative, no choice, but to take Islam's laws later on. It won't be forced onto them but they will recognize that the statistics are showing that this is the best alternative to the situation that we're living in. Now, this is important. It's very common that you would hear Muslims always saying, well, we just need to, we just need to get the khilafah and that's it. Not recognizing that throughout history, I'm not anti-khilafah, of course, but one thing I would like to say is that throughout history, if we were to look at whether we're talking about Khilafah Abbasiyah or whether we're talking about Khilafah Umayyah before that, Khilafah Umayyah, Abbasiyah, Mamalik, you, oh, what if we talk about Uthmaniyah as well? There were a lot of injustices, even in the Khilafah. Can you believe that it was a common practice in the Khilafah Uthmaniyah that if there is a Khalifa, that all his siblings would actually be slaughtered? 
This is in the Khilafa. In the Khilafa, all his siblings, even babies, would actually be slaughtered. In the Khilafa, in order to cause political stability by not having another rivalry in the future. This is in the Khilafa. Is this an Islamic practice? We know it's not an Islamic practice. Absolutely, this is an Isla not an Islamic practice. This is just one example. If you were to actually go to Jordan, you were, you were to go to Iraq, et cetera, you will see how different practices of even lesbianism, LGBT, different kinds, and even the poetry in where it would speak about Il-Murd was actually practiced even during the time of Khilafa. This is real. This is real. What is that supposed to tell us? That it's not an issue of having a frame of, of a frame of governance called the Khilafa. It's actually the governance as the principle that you adopt as a Muslim. That's the true Khilafa. That's the true Khilafa. This is the true Khilafa because this is the governance that the Prophet was actually calling for is that to make a deen be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you set that in your personal life at an individual level and even within the society, you will see that even the West and even the non-Muslim countries, once you as a Muslim, every single individual actually shows that the practice and makes the practice become from an individual practice to a practice that becomes nothing but kind of like what Kant was saying, the universal imperialism, once you actually see that this has actually become a universal practice, that's when you would actually see that the true Khilafa will actually be there. It really is you now when we actually talk about why we're why are we talking about this let's continue with the a okay where were we <laughs> you started we started the a started the a and probably never never moved on right but it's the point the principle. You, have to the principle you have to live the principle exactly so then the a continues when and of course and in order to speak about women's rights in terms of choosing the husband and the a continues that in situations where they want to move on and get married to someone else, that in that situation, they don't have the right not to take their wealth, not to take their money, and certainly not to have the control over their own consent. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizing that they don't have the right, that is the men, to put in a narrative that would um, that would strip women's rights away from their financial rights and claiming that, well, it's basically because she is nothing but a property. So according, according to Islam, that no, she's not a property and therefore her wealth and that woman are both actually independent uh, independent rights for the woman. We talked about that and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was basically um, telling us that even if they have been divorced, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them, well, you have to give some sanctity to the bond that was between you and where you were transparent with one another. You had unrevealed a lot and exposed a lot of one another. So in other words, exactly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, had praised the salihat for salihat qanitatun hafudatun lil ghaib for the pious women they are qanitat they are submiss submissive to the lord almighty hafudatun lil ghaib they would preserve the the things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was uh, was basically the only witness on and her so therefore telling them that if this is a divorce how is it with a marriage and it's really sad when we speak about uh, women exposing things about their husbands and sometimes even exposing even private details. And right now with social media, even and even it, it's really sad that you would see even women actually putting up 
photos or pictures of her and her husband actually making up, even if that person is halal to you, even if it's your husband, you should not actually expose that in the in, in public whatsoever. This is supposed to be totally private. To make up is a private thing. In fact, il buyut awra. Even the bait, even your bedroom is aura. No one is supposed to have access to your bedroom unless you had actually completely covered and basically preserved your privacy. Don't let anybody just have access to your bedroom, let alone access to your personal private relationship between you and your husband. Even if the relationship is halal, that should not be public information. You hugging your husband and making that as a profile picture is not acceptable in Islam. You might say, well, what's the, well, why not? He's halal to me. I'm not telling you that that's zina. I'm telling you to expose yourself to expose the private relationship between you and your husband is basically what is the word actually means gaps or holes is honor is honor so to expose such privacies although not necessarily haram, but it is khawarim al muru'a. It's near haram. It is a dishonorable thing to actually expose that khawarim al muru'a. It's basically putting holes and gaps inside your honor. It's putting holes inside your honor. In other words, you're a person that lacks honor. When you say putting holes in the honor that actually is more of an idiom to say that this person is lacking honor. Lacking honor. What is honor? Honor is izzah. Honor is muru'a. Honor is chivalry. Honor is when you actually protect your privacy, you basically protect yourself from other people interfering in your personal business. Now that's important. Why? Because two things, when you expose yourself too much, one, you either become susceptible to hasad or you become susceptible to other people interfering in your personal business and possibly getting into considering your business being public and then getting in between you and your husband and who knows what they could do. So by preserving your privacy and preserving your honor, you're letting even if we're talking about a chance of 1% of anybody causing you harm, 1%, one person is enough to disrupt and dismantle your marriage. One person is enough. So Islam tells you, don't even allow not even one person from interfering in your personal business. So Islam tells you, protect your honor. Learn how to keep yourself of value because the second that you expose your private information, you become of no value. Why? Because anything that is exposed becomes easy access to people. The things that are given easy access are usually the cheap things. So Islam tells you, don't be cheap. That's why you would have high security cameras, surveillance, etc., all these different things in treasures and very expensive stores. But you won't actually find it for vegetables and fruits. Why? Because that's available everywhere. But one ring, it could be one ring and it could be any anything valuable, a, ge a valuable gem, and they'll put all these security cameras on it. And that's the same thing. 
is that don't expose yourself because your private information is what makes you valuable, is what gives you honor. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the women, it's telling the women and telling the men, don't expose one another. Such information becomes an amana. Even if you were to get divorced, the private information and what happened is to stay private. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Allah before the Lord Almighty, those that were in dispute, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the one to deal and end the dispute. Don't expose it. It's an amana with you. Even if that's a case of divorce. And do not and do not get married to. Now, here's one thing. Uh, let me stop at the word nakaha in, in just a bit. Okay. We're not going to stop at it right now. Okay. The word nakaha in just a bit. And do not get married to Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah And do not, the word is nakah. I'm going to get to the word nakah in just a bit. Nakah actually means to get married to um, uh, the women that your fathers have been married to before. Except what had happened before, there's nothing that you could change about it. For it is an illicit and uh, and المقت uh, is to be hated, is to be abolished, to be hated, to be something that is totally detested. So what is the word nekaha? So this is actually talking about getting married, the men getting married to any woman that their fathers have been married to. In other words, your stepmother. Okay. So any woman that the man sorry, that the father had married before, the sons are not allowed to marry that woman. Whether that woman is a divorcee or whether that woman is, in still, is still in the marriage bond. Why was that even an issue? Well, that was an issue because that was a practice during the Jahiliya. It actually goes back to the previous ayat that we were doing because it was actually a common practice where when a woman, because they regarded that a woman was a property, just like in this A right here, because they regarded women were property, when the father would die, his wives, they basically would also be inherited, not giving the inheritance, but literally the woman herself would actually be inherited by the sons. All right. 
So what happens is that the sons, of course, if she's an older woman, probably might, might not have interest in her. If she was younger, he would he might have some interest. So the women, before putting a cloak on her, which at the time resembled that now her uh, she had right now transitioned from the property of the father to right now the for the property of whoever um swiftly puts his cloak on her that was going to announce that now she's under my wing slash now she's under my uh, sexual property basically i know exactly what that that was the stepmother not his mother but that was the stepmother okay so islam had totally abolished such practice and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right there calls it fahisha and maqta. The word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses is that it is a fahisha. It is nothing but an illicit behavior and maqta. It is also extremely detested and extremely ugly. And in fact, when you see this ayah, al fahisha and al maqt, even the child that actually comes from such as a result of this type of a relationship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, called him maqt. So it would be a maqt. It would be, uh, it would, in fact, the Arab themselves used to call him maqt as well. Um, but here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reiterated or in, even, in fact, use the same word that it is maqt. It's a hated practice and should be stopped and terminate and permanently something terminated in term and permanently abolished. Go ahead, my dear. So it doesn't matter Yeah, absolutely. And, and according to the Jahiliya, yeah, according to the Jahiliya, yes, it doesn't matter if she basically had children. So she can have kids with her father and the son. Of the exactly. Father. There you go. That she could actually have the children from the father and the son as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, exactly, it's called the maqt. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized do not marry the women that your fathers that your fathers had had a marriage relationship before, all right? Now, here's a question. What if, oh, first, let me let me actually emphasize a number of different things that I probably should have actually mentioned. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fahisha, maqta, maqta, and even sa'asabila. I want you to look at these three words right there because three things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it. And this is important because when we look at sa'asabila, what is sa'asabila? Is sabil is to be a path, all right? Is sabil is to be a path, which actually tells us that in Islam, when you look at the way that Islam had regarded what makes a halal relationship, a marriage, or something that is a permissible bond, a marriage bond, in other words, it is permissible for these two people to get married. And the reason why Islam abolished and regarded zina or even LGBT or even annual annual relations as impermissible because more than just the children finding the rights. That was the main reason. So the main reason is really one, to ensure women's rights, two, to ensure the children's rights that they recognize, one, their fathers, they would recognize. And of course, what does it mean that they recognize their father? Yeah, I'll tell them that that's his father. That's not the story here. The story is that the child's rights would actually be secured, number one, financially, Two, um, even when their name, three, psychologically, socially, and the find it in all the different ends in where this child recognizes and has his rights secured before his birth, even. In other words, even during the time of pregnancy. Because if the woman, for example, if the woman is pregnant, we need to make sure that to sustain this pregnant woman is basically going to be the responsibility of the father himself, not the government. Remember how we did the phone example? Not the government, but the father. 
what the what the Western governments right now are doing, they're basically giving more indiv individual and in considering the sanctity of individual freedom and basically regarding later that, well, the government would actually hold the load. Islam says no. Let the individuals act responsibly, and that way the government won't be responsible for all the different the different um, uh, economical and financial responsibilities. You see the difference? Yes. You see the difference? So Islam says, no, let the father be responsible. That's the natural way of doing it. Let the father be responsible rather than the government end up paying section eight and end up probably needing to finance and subsidize the child in probably EBT and financial assistance and cash assistance. No, let the father work. Once we would get those men to work, that all is going to support the government, support the child, and we would not have wasted energy. Islam considers that the man having wasted energy in basically just pregnant, impregnating with these women here and there, that's basically a going to be whose price, who's going to be paying, and at whose expense, who's going to be paying the price for that? It's going to be the community. So Islam says, why should we have the community pay the price for it? That's why Islam says, well, we need to sanction and make sure that every single person is acting responsible. We have a lot of young people, mashallah. <laughs> I wish we had them before. I did book my ticket December 25th, everybody. 25th. No. I know. I'm going to miss you all. It's like, I wish my teacher had been talks about me the way you talk about stuff. Oh my God. Don't worry, they don't know who you are. I'll tell them it's a shorty one. She's asking if you're willing to adopt them if I'm willing to adopt an adult, I think I got my husband, that's enough. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmuddin, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا ألم تر أننا أرسلنا الشياطين على الكافرين تؤذهم أزا فلا تعجل عليهم إنما نعد لهم عزا يوم نحشر المتقين إلى الرحمن وفدا ونسوق المجرمين إلى جهنم وفدا لا يملكون الشفاعة إلا من اتخذ عند الرحمن عهدا وقالوا اتخذ الرحمن ولدا لقد جئتم شيئا إدا تكاد السماوات يتفطرن منه وتنشق الأرض وتخر الجبال هدا دعوا للرحمن ولدا وما ينبغي للرحمن أن يتخذ ولدا إن كل من في السماوات والأرض إلا آت الرحمن عبدا لقد أحصاهم وعدهم عدا وكلهم آتيه يوم القيامة فردا إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات سيجعل لهم الرحمن
بحسن ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غفاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى فيذكر من يخشى ويتجنب الأشقى الذي يصل النار خبرا ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا في الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Assalamualaikum
Oh, so that was what we were trying to do, huh? We're working on obesity. There you go. I drank the water in the last only water, not drink. <laughs> so I guess you're gonna start getting carrots instead? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Should we? Yeah. Thank you. There you go. All right, should we continue, ladies? Because of time. Yeah. So we were talking about Islam's concept, basically of in securing justice is not by basically trying to somehow put more sanctions in order to later stop different wrong things from happening, but Islam actually considers, no, uproot the problem from the very start of it. That's why in Islam, of course, it, uh, we would consider, and by the way, there was a word that I said it was actually wrong while well, I was going over what I was saying, which is, um, uh, I was, I believe, universal imperialism. It's actually um, universal imperative. Uh, I, I was I was actually, so, sometimes when... We don't notice the difference. Oh, you don't notice the difference? No. It's a huge difference. <laughs> Huge difference. All right. So the universal imperative, although that's not necessarily what Islam considers in terms of um, that that the law that law or at least the the theory uh, the theory in terms of um, ethics, but Islam considers that when we would scrutinize the whole theory and the whole idea of Islam in terms of the the, the thought theory and or, or even in terms of the philosophy of ethics, it's really important to look at these ayats. So Islam calls that as fahisha. Fahisha to mean that the, the behavior itself is illicit. Maqat, it is hated. And sa'a sabila. What sa'a sabila literally means that it takes the wrong route. Sa'a sabila takes the wrong route. So the question is, well, what is the route? Anyways, what route was it really considering as a priority? The root was justice. So if the person were to get married to their father's wife, other than his mother, that that, go, what, that, that was going to bring in injustices, injustices by conflating um, the different uh, the different progenies and conflating the different brothers and sisters, responsibilities, etc. And this is important to look at because Islam also considers that by recognizing the lines, the social structure is actually part and in fact the basis of considering um, one, economical rights, social rights, psychological rights, all those are going to be founded on securing how you actually draw the lines in terms of relationship so that actually starts so you don't you don't try to fix and try to put in the policies of how to make sure that these individuals rights are actually secured but you actually put the laws in the basis of it so in other words before you even talk about the rights of the children you have to first talk about preventing and considering that the sexual freedom that that is supposed to be sanctioned from the, the start that is to be sanctioned from the start in order to make sure that the consequence and the result is protecting the children and protecting the women's rights whether we're talking about psychologically or whether we're talking about socially, or whether we're talking about financially, economically, at the end of the day, you sanction it from there. So that's why Islam would consider that the main problem with a lot of the different philosophies of ethics in different, in, um, in, in different uh, philosophies is really regarding al-hawa, is regarding the desires as God. What, what does it mean as God? Do they see that they would worship somehow, you know, in a some kind of a temple putting desires there and saying that that is God? No. But just by the second that that becomes the center, 
that would determine how laws are distributed by considering that is the center that give people the right to choose their sexual partner and sexual practice and give them the freedom within that area. Islam regards that you had just made your desires as the God and as the place. Do you see those that would take their hawa, their desires as the God? Do they necessarily worship themselves? No. Just by letting your desires determine the rights and justices and the prob and in all those different areas of um, behaviors, then that actually means you had regarded that that is the center. The center is sexual freedom. Once you regard that as the center, and therefore, this is so sacred that we should never sanction it because it's so sacred. That would actually mean you had regarded it as your God. So Islam says, well, wait a minute. No, you need to go outside of regarding that as the area that determines all the rights and responsibilities to zooming out and considering principle slash Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his sharia as the God. Oh? As the God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his principle, those are taking the superiority over our own desires. And that we should live based on the principle and not bend the principle to basically suit our desires the opposite way all right so that's why for a believer we would submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not submit to our desires because we would regard that the desires would basically delude the masses and that principles would always be the principles those are the highest level the principle is the highest level and that is the place that would actually be the uh, the, the priority that we would regard as having the sanctity, the principles. That's what has the sanctity. <laughs> so the women, there are certain, so this is number one. I do actually want to say, <laughs> Scholars actually had differences of opinions. Let me give you a scenario. The scenario says, can the son marry a woman that there was not a marriage contract slash a marriage, a valid marriage contract? The father wasn't in a val valid marriage contract in, but he had a haram relationship with that woman. Mom? That's not his mom, though. But he had a haram relationship with that woman. The father said, I had a haram relationship with that woman. Is it permissible that the son would actually marry that woman in a halal marriage? No. No? How many people say yes? What if she made tawbah? Will you forgive her? Alhamdulillah, but I'm just making sure. Okay. <laughs> How many people say yes? That he can get married to her? Yes, because the risk of marriage. We already talked about Okay. No. How many people say no? All right. Majority of the scholars actually say he cannot get married to her because... I want you to look at this word right here because the ayah, majority of the scholars, not all, because they said, they said, well, this is referring to a marriage bond. Yet, other scholars like the Shafi'i, which is majority of you are actually Shafi'i. If you're Somali, you're most likely Shafi'i. All right. They actually considered that the word nakaha can actually mean two things. One, it can mean in a legal marriage bond and that it can also mean to have intimacy with. 
So they said, well, the word itself can, although the general meaning is to have a marriage contract, but it can also include to have intimacy with. Whether that intimacy was within a halal relationship or whether it was outside of a halal relationship. So that was the Shafi'i Madhab. Let's actually consider why that also would make sense. Let's go for a deeper case. Deeper case? Man A is the dad. Man A, the dad, gets into a haram relationship with B, woman. Let's give her some long hair. B, woman. B, woman gets a girl from dad A. That's girl C. Got it? Dad A was married to another woman, D, and he actually had our guy, let's call him K. K, all right, you guys with me? K somehow got to know C. There you go. Is that his sister or not? Step Shafi'i Madhab would actually regard, even if it's outside of wedlock, that technically they actually have the same genetic coding, the same genes. Therefore, even if it's outside of marriage, it would still be considered haram or the least that it is a shubha to get married to her. Majority of scholars, actually, the, the, the main evidence for the Shafi'i, they said, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكَحَ أَبَاءُكُمْ And the word nakaha would actually mean whether we're talking about intimacy or whether we're talking about a marriage contract. They said, even as if that results into a child, the child would still be considered technically his sister or even, let's even go even farther, can man A actually get married to daughter C? No. You see it? You see the point? The, the other scholars that said, well, this actually refers to a marriage contract, they said, well, that's not even his daughter. You see, you see, you guys see that? They said, it's not uh, his daughter. He said, why not? Isn't she his daughter? They said, well, it wasn't in a marriage contract and she doesn't hold his name. Therefore, she's not his daughter. You guys see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? You, you see what I'm saying? You, you guys understand what I'm saying here? The, the, <laughs> You guys, this is a taste of fiqh. Yeah. This is a taste of fiqh. You see, now they're looking into these words and we would just think, oh, how did they have a difference of opinion? You see, they go into these words and these debates, but the Shafi'iyah here nailed it. The Shafi'iyah here nailed it. And they said, listen, if we were to actually just look at that word, well, let's go even farther. What's going to happen if dad were to actually get married to C. No. Are you going to say that that's permissible? No. So that's why the Shafi'iyah, they said, no, 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 we cannot just look at that as a silent thing. Let's look at the implication of that fatwa. Look at them. Said, so let's look at the implication of that fatwa and the implication of such an interpretation. This is what's going to happen is that your God, dad A is going to end up actually being halal to marry daughter C. He's marrying his own daughter. <laughs> but I have another argument. If I adopt, I cannot call a kid another person's name. So even if it's out of wedlock, still. Well, here's daughter. the thing is that look at this word here, wasa asabila. You, this is a very important sabila in where whenever you're conflicting, it's talking about a path, it's talking about a progeny. So that would tell you that when when you were looking at marriage, it goes farther than just a social bond. And if you if you actually let's take a look at a hadith. This man comes to the Prophet Sallam doubting this child that his wife had. 
Why? He's black. I was like, wait a minute. I'm white. This son is black. He doubted. He was like, uh, something's not right here. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, do you have any camels? Yes, I do. Are there any warq camels? Alaysa fiha awraq. It, don't you have a camel? So if you've got a herd, a camel herd, a, 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 a herd of camels, but then one actually has a different color. He said, yes. He said, well, maybe this one is a hurq too. What the Prophet was explaining that maybe this one, just like your camels, they too had some kind of a genetic thing in the past. Maybe your son also had something genetic in the past that you were not aware of. You are right, but maybe down the road, she had it or you had an ancestry of somebody black in your genetics. You never know. You never know. And when you look at that, the Prophet was really indicating that there is in genetics, there's something to study. There's something to consider, the, whether it's this hadith where the Prophet was really emphasizing there is a genetic compound that must be considered. Same thing. This area right here is also hinting that there is a genetic compound that must be considered, which is that sabil. When you use the word sabil, sabil means path. When you look at path, path of what? But sa is sin, right? Sa means sa means it's a it's an evil or a, a sin or a deviant path. So when you look at deviant path, a path of what? Pathing where? Going where? Well, that actually tells you that it was giving a hint that there was a genetic map to something. There was a genetic map to something that's not enough to just look at things as if it's just an issue of relations and we're just talking about something. No, there is a genetic compound that must actually be considered in where there is a map involved. There's a map involved in where biology, psychology, sociology, economy, all of it, you may not recognize it, but there is a map within nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put within. You cannot conflate it. You cannot confuse those paths because the second you confuse those paths is the second that you had actually caused something to come back at you and actually cross these paths and bring in nothing but destruction in the society. You wanted to, somebody, I believe you want to say something, my dear. So differences of opinions between scholars, that's the, that's the point. <laughs> Remember they had differences of opinions between, uh, between them on the word nakaha. And that as a result actually got me into a totally different, uh, a totally different debate. You see that? But is their siblings. For Shabi'i, they're siblings. Okay, I have a question. Yes. If there was no intimacy, I remember mm -hmm. this is the one with water, maybe I got it wrong. If there's no intimacy, whether halal or haram or marriage contract the father was interested in amulo and then the guy the boy also liked her then can they if, if there's no marriage contract there's no intimacy what are the rules that so you want k to get married to kind of competing for the same uh, but then there was no intimacy i'm just asking, so down. you're so saying you hold on is there a relationship or not so there's a relationship oh, give me a and b what, what let's put it there okay so a woman is B, father is A, son is C. The father knew the woman, he was talking to her, but then they never married. Fair enough, no fair enough, the fair enough. Comes up and then she likes the son. You know what? Let, I'm just asking because you mentioned it. In the right. Let, let me let me explain it. I see what you're saying. I'm gonna I'm gonna hear. I'm gonna use. Let's learn everything now. Right. <laughs> let's do it. Listen to this, you guys. So you know what? We're actually gonna get to explaining that one later on. Okay, but we're it's okay to get it now. Here we go. You got guy A has a son B. 
Got it? They both were interested in woman C. Pay attention. Scenario A. Scenario A. A and C had a marriage contract. We'll get to it. A and C has a, had a marriage contract. Now, in this situation, B somehow got into an affair, not intimacy, but then somehow C decided, why am I going for the old guy? Let me go for the young guy. Hmm? So she basically ended the relationship, broke the contract somehow, and then C and B wanted to get married. Now, A and C, they had a marriage contract, but were never intimate. Was not consummated. Now, first opinion would say, wait a minute, no. The word nekaha to mean marriage contract, he cannot actually get into a marriage bond with C. B, you cannot get married to C because the word nekaha means a marriage contract. The second opinion says, well, no, the word nekaha means to be intimate. Since C and A were not intimate, therefore, well, since it didn't work out between them, C and B can get married because there was no intimacy. Let's flip it. What if C and B had a marriage contract. They hold on. C and B had a marriage contract. Later, she didn't like B. Oh, he's just a child. Let me go for a wise guy. Let's go for the dad. Well, A just for having a marriage contract between C and B. A can never get married to C, even if that was just a marriage contract. Yeah. Even if that was just a marriage contract. Let's do the other way. We're going to right now replace it with women. We've got Explain woman why A. It, why? We're going to... Well, Okay, fair enough. Let's do it. Explain why. So when you look at where's oh where's our wait? See now our, our A's and B's got lost. Hold on. <laughs> I don't know how did it get lost? It was there, but I should give me chocolate for somebody else. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Let's do it again. We've got a dude and we had the B dude, right? We had the B dude and we had C woman, okay? Okay, and we said C woman got in a marriage contract with this. So why not? So the reason for why not, because if we were to do the opposite, let's say A and C are in a marriage contract and later C and B were to get married, okay? The father doesn't have the same sentiments towards his son as, as how the son would have sentiments towards the father. What does that mean? The father would forgive his son, but the son would never forgive the father. You see it? That's where, and of course, this is according to that, that opinion that regarded that nekaha would actually mean the marriage contract. Now, the other part, or the actually intimacy. Now, the other part, let's say this is woman A. Okay, this is woman A. She had a daughter B. Got it? I'm going to make them long hair. Okay, she had a daughter B. A guy 
he basically comes in and of course men causing problem there we, right <laughs> the other day i was watching this video that was really it was kind of like very funny i don't know so women men are behind all the problems men opas men uh men tall illness <laughs> Menstruation. menstruation menstrual cramping so men 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 you know it's it's that's it <laughs> but that's actually that's actually wrong i mean but you know sometimes you just come across videos you're like what whatever you know shaitan is evil is getting to the Shikha. Fem getting into the Shikha. There you go. The feminism is getting to the Shikha, even if she does these videos about feminism. But you could see their rhetoric is really going far. We've got a problem here. Okay, let's continue with A and B. Okay, we got Guy D. So Guy D basically proposed to woman A. They had a marriage contract. A marriage contract. But then... He was fascinated with A and decided to end the marriage contract between him and woman A and go for the daughter. She's vibrant, more beautiful, young. Now, if there was a marriage contract between D and A and he ended it, that would actually be permissible for him to get to marry B later on. Let's flip the situation. What if D and B had a marriage contract? Intimacy or no intimacy? No intimacy. Just a marriage contract. D and B had a marriage contract. Later, he felt that this young teenager was just too stupid. <laughs> All right. So he decided, well, let me get to the mom. She's actually a wise mother. I don't know how this wise mother bore a stupid child, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> whatever. Sorry, ladies. I'm just trying to make it humorous. Okay. But whatever. It, it can happen. So D decided, I'm going to end the, the marriage contract with B and go to A. Uh uh. We can't have that. Even if it's just a marriage contract, yes. Even if it's just a marriage contract. Why? Because the daughter and the sentiments that a daughter would have towards her mother are totally different than a mother would have towards the daughter. The, the daughter would never forgive her mother. But the, the mother would actually forgive her daughter for taking away this expected candidate. Are you guys with me here? Yeah. Now, what if, what if A and D not only had a marriage contract, but they were even intimate? He's not her dad, obviously, but they were intimate. They consummated the marriage. Never can B get married to D. That's her stepfather. Even if they divorce? Even if they divorce, he will always be her stepfather. Now, then scholars actually had differences of opinions on whether she is considered a Rabiba or not, whether she can take off her hijab or not, when and why not, and what if she was since early childhood, does she have to grow up in that same household or not? All those different questions we'll talk about next week. We only did one A. I know it's like. Well, in, the, in, yep. the, in the sense where they divorce, where where D and A divorce, would D still be B's mahram in that case? Yes, he would still be. But stay tuned because we're going to get to more details when we actually this is really important girls because once we get to this one right here this is going to be the crux of the whole question inshallah next week stay tuned there's a lot to say all right. I was really hoping to finish this. This area we're most likely going to probably take into two classes, but inshallah, hopefully we won't need to. All right. You can see this area, you guys, it yeah. relates to a lot. All right. Go ahead, my dear. So this is just a question. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So, if, if I had a stepfather and he was married to my mother and they divorced, or my mom, or my mom passed away, like this is just an example. Fair enough. So, would his would I would he still be responsible of me? No. Your father, your biological father is the one that's responsible for you. Never is your stepfather Even responsible for you. Even if your biological father has passed, your stepfather is not responsible for you. So, Unless he, un he can be a mahram. Being a mahram is, is, is totally different than being responsible for you financially or even being your wali. We can give him some honor for taking care of you and stuff like that, but he can never be your wali. So then what happens to the child then? Or what would happen to me? What would happen to you? That so, is, your so, dad passed away. Someone else becomes your willy. That's so why. If my mom and your, your, Oh, fair enough. If my your willy becomes your, your grandfather. After your grandfather, it's your uncles. After your uncles, it's basically your your brothers. So there's always somebody to take care of you. So it's not my stepfather. No, it's never is your stepfather. Can he get the wasi? Uh, he, the, he can the definitely be the wasi. Okay. Absolutely, he can be the wasi. Anybody can be the wasi. Even a stranger can be the wasi. Oh. Right? So a wasi is basically to give him a power of attorney. Yeah, yeah a stranger can be a wasi. So can give that to him then? The, the wali, the person, the person that is the, the following wali would be the person to give it wasi. All right? So it or the qadi, or the qadi can assign a wasi and say, I want you to be the guardian because her awliya are basically not qualified to be awliya. So the qadi can intervene and say, well, because this girl is vulnerable, um, she doesn't have anybody, he can assign assign an organization to be a wali and or he can he can be the wali himself or even assign somebody to be the wasi on her uh on uh, basically on her behalf go ahead so he's not allowed to give my hand in marriage to someone no 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 he's not unless so here's what happens on a side layers so can the stepfather be the wali on behalf of this girl yeah. is the question. The, the general rule, if there is no wali, the Prophet ﷺ said, As -sultan wali man la wali What is a sultan? A sultan doesn't mean, you know, the sultan, you know, the guy with the turban on his head and he's got this little, uh, I don't know, this little gem in the middle. That's not the sultan. A sultan is the person in charge, whether it's the qadi or whether it's the Islamic center, all right? They would be the people in charge, in responsibility, and held accountable to oversee that this is in your favor, Okay. And in your interest, they're responsible. So the Islamic Center is, this is one thing, the Islamic Center, and there should be nonprofit organizations that basically do background checking and that basically are there to help the women investigate and be and act as the wali, not only in investigation, but also be there when the, something goes wrong to probably provide shelters, to probably provide financial support and to probably provide um, therapy, whatever it is, there should be organizations to do that, okay? Now, sometimes the Qadi, just out of honor, can give that stepfather or maybe the uncle, maternal uncle, who really cannot be the wali, to really be the person in charge just to give honor. You understand what I'm saying? But technically, he can never be the wedding. So it's just out of honor. So what if a girl got married and the qadi told her stepfather to be the wedding and actually speak when he didn't actually do it? Is that marriage invalid? No, it's not. <laughs> I was like, that's it. I'm doomed. So long with my husband. The marriage is valid, my dear, because the Qadi 
that is the person that was in charge was the one that gave him the power of attorney to act on his behalf. Okay. I, I, I like the second that she was like, that's it. I'm never going to see my husband again. And when I said that, she was like, yeah. I'm going to go back home and start hugging her husband. My dear. <laughs> For a second, you could see her heart really drop. Yeah. It's like, just hold on. You see it? I hope I answered that one. Fatima Jibedi, go ahead, my dear. So you said that, um, if, let's say the father passed away. The, his father is the wali of the daughters, right? And then let's imagine that the grandfather already passed away. Now the uncles, one of the uncles will be the, will be the wali, right? Right. Now, here's one thing. I believe you were Moroccan. So let me let me explain something very important. Why am I even talking about Moroccan? So Maliki Madhab actually has a different map of priorities of awliya than the other madhahib. Got it? Morocco is, Morocco is Maliki. And most of these ladies right here, we've got Maliki right there. Where else? Um, where were you from? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Okay, so we've got Hanafi right there. Okay, so um, Malikis are usually West Africa. Okay, West Africa and North Africa. Those are Malikis. For the Malikis, they actually have a set that is different than the majority. So you, they would debate whether it's the uncle goes after the grandfather or whether it's the brother that goes after. And then they would debate whether ever the son would ever actually be a wali at all they actually had a very fair argument a very fair argument so the malikis they actually regarded why on earth would the son ever be a wali for his mother all right that, that makes sense yeah it was like she's the one that bore him to give him such authority is degrading the mother uh, right <laughs> Right? The Shafi'is, they said, no, he's actually a mahram. He's going to be responsible for her financially. He's going to be responsible for if anything goes wrong, even socially, all these different areas. Why not? So they said, it's not an authority. It's not a tashrif. It's a taklif. Look at that. It's, it's really interesting. You guys, they're so smart. They said this is not an issue of honor and dishonor. They said whoever said that the wali was in any way giving an honor to somebody. They said this is a taklif. This is a responsibility and not an honor. This is not to dishonor the mother. Just as by considering the father as a, as a wali, this is not to dishonor the, uh, the, the daughter. They said this is a tekshri, taklif, not a tekshri. You guys see the It's amazing. Yeah. You would listen to the debate and you'd be like, I would never think about that from that angle. Beautiful, huh? Yeah. How many people like yeah. fiqh now? <laughs> you don't like fiqh still? You got lost? No. no, no. no? <laughs> it's important to taste it because when you recognize fiqh, you expand your area of vision. You expand your area of vision and you expand the area of how you recognize how Islam had set the vertebra the vertebra of ethics. It's beautiful. But you have to be beautiful stoic too. Oh, you you, you got to be alert. because If you're not alert and you don't understand and you don't pay attention, you could easily like, what? I mean, my question now is, can you shift your mother like depending on whatever you go by? Like, let's say your mother Fair you don't like whatever they're doing and then just go by whatever. Fair enough. So for, for the mother, you don't have to adopt a particular mother. Okay, because even the madhab, and that's a very interesting thing that Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Qudama actually wrote in his book, Ilam al-Muqirin, or Alam al -Muqirin. you could actually read it both ways. Anyhow, so he was saying to adopt a madhab is not at all something that is obligatory anyways. And there's no obligation unless there was something that in the text it was actually obligating you to do so. And there's, and we know that that historically speaking, that 
the Hanafis, the Maliki, etc. They were all agreeing if the hadith is proven to be authentic, then that's my madhab. So it's not the interpretation that we would necessarily be phonetic to, but it's actually the authentic reference that we're phonetic to, or at least we're strict in, in holding on to that rather than the word phonetic, which actually carries a very wrong connotation. Okay, we're actually talking about being strict, not on a madhab, but we're strict in holding on to the reference. Got it? We're strict on to holding on to the reference and not the interpretation unless the reference supports such an interpretation. Now, at the same time, it's important to study the madhahib because the madhahib, they were actually holding on to the guidelines of making sure that the interpretation goes in accordance with, number one, Quran, two, Sunnah, three, for taking consideration the different things in relationship to, to the chronology of the different events, etc. All these different things, and of course, the qiyas of it, or the analogy of it. And who was actually taking in these considerations? They were basically the madhahib. So to follow a madhab, especially if you're basically a starter in learning fiqh, is the safest way to make sure that you're not making selective. <gasps> Pay attention to this one. Is to make sure that you're not making, making selective interpretations based on your exactly. desire. Mm -hmm. To follow a madhab is to keep you safe from being selective, unless when we're speaking about the general layman, they don't have a madhab and your madhab, if you're not qualified to research the evidences, then your responsibility would be one, to ask someone that has the knowledge Two, to ask someone that you would trust their, their taqwa to research. Three, you also ask someone that is capable of knowing the realities and also the text to do the research and make sure that they understand the question that you're asking and also the text. Why? Because the text is nothing but an application to, a, to a, a, a practice or a situation on ground. So what we need is a person that has the taqwa to connect the dot of text with the dot of context. The dot, these two dots, text and context, because Islam is not to be exacerbated in its legal maxims from the context and the analogy and the legal maxims to why Sharia was actually designed in that way. You see what I'm saying? So Islam is about a practice with a clear vision of both the text and the context. Do I have to follow a madhab? Your madhab would be the madhab of the scholar that you trust their ilm, the scholar that you trust their research, a scholar that you trust their piety. Oh, but it would be good to learn from a madhab and the chosen madhab to learn from that I would recommend is the Shafi'i madhab. Why? This uh, yes, Somali. Well, I, I would recommend studying the Shafi'i Madhab. Not that I'm anti other Madhab, but Hanafi Madhab actually requires a lot of research and understanding the analogy. Very smart, extremely smart, but before you study the analogy of things, it's important that you would study the reference. Madhab al-Shafi'i went through a stage of Qadim and Jadid, went through a stage of studying 
through first the Maliki and then later through Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani and then later went through studying through Layth ibn Sa'd. So Madhab al-Shafi'i combined the Maliki, the Hanafi, and, the, and later, of course, when you're looking at later on, all those different foundations in his book al risala were to lay out the foundation of how you study usul and how you study furu'ah, how you study the fundamentals of the deen and how you study later the different details of the deen. So that's why the Shafi'i is my recommended place of starting for somebody that is starting to study fiqh. Now that doesn't mean you don't study the Maliki and you don't, if you're capable of studying comparative fiqh, by all means, go for it. Go ahead, my dear. You can, in, in the beginning, follow everything in that madhab. Until you become an expert, you should not stick to the madhab if, through your research, you discovered that that, that is not the preponderant evidence. No, that's not the Shafi'i. That's the Hanafi, my dear. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Shafi'i madhab. For the Hanafi madhab, your wudu never breaks, even for touching. For the Shafi'i, for the Hanbali and Maliki, it depends on your intention. Does your wudu break? That for the Hanbali and the Maliki, they would actually consider that your wudu would break only if you are to have the 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 actual inzel or the actual um the actual fluid to basically discharge for the shafi'iya they would consider even if you were to touch mahram or not mahram uh, your wife or not your wife even if it's a young daughter like a ramli would actually say they would consider that that breaks your wudu why because they actually went to the ayah the word lamastum, they actually said for the Shafi'iya, they said lamastum, this is lams, just an actual touch. But not the husband. Even the husband, they said touch, halas. You touch a woman, you're trying to pass out the phone and accidentally your hand touches your husband's hand. You didn't mean anything with it. You just gave him the phone. In fact, you're angry at him. Okay? <laughs> your water goes. According to Shafi'iya, for Hanafi, they said, you know what? Even if he gives her a kiss, his wadu doesn't go away. Which one is preponderant? I can Hanafi. In this matter, the Hanafi is more preponderant in this matter. Why? Because the Prophet went before even going to Salah. He even kissed his wives before even going to Salah. Can this hadith is sahih. Oh, yeah, there you go. You want to be Shafi'i, and then with this one, I'll go with the preponderant. Yeah, is that allowed? It is allowed. It is allowed if you actually had proven evidence. <laughs> go ahead, maybe. His wadu that breaks, his and your wadu. According to Shafi'i, according to Shafi'i, his, his wadu and their wadu. Oh, or his wadu and the person touching. You have young people who came today, you have to say hi to them. Hi to them, not a salam alaikum. Okay. <laughs> so this, I hope I answered you, Fatima Jibari Umri. Uh, we got done with, yeah, yes. Zainab, Alhamdulillah, we got done with one A. We tried. <laughs> all right. Fatima, Habibti Rabbi, Yahfadik Ya Rabbi, and inshallah, we'll see you all next week, inshallah. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wednesday, stay tuned. We're getting a whole A. That's a lot of work. <laughs> Wouldn't this be like fatwa shopping if one keeps changing madhab? So it, it would be fatwa shopping if you're changing the madhab because it suits you and your desire. But it wouldn't be madhab fatwa shopping if what was what was the basis of why you considered another fatwa was really the evidence that it was su supported by. Okay, now you see it. Alhamdulillah. All right, so we'll see you all next week, inshallah, Rabbi uh, Yafatku. I know, we did a lot. Yeah, yeah, we did a lot. Are we going to finish this?
December you were gonna finish the surah before December twenty. Yeah, we're really getting close. We're just at air twenty three. Depends how Palestine goes. Depends how Palestine goes. There, we'll probably just stay here, right? Go ahead, my dear. We did get the passports. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. At least I'm American. There you go. I'm American. At least you're American. Sure. Can we? I don't mind if you guys are okay me adding another day. I don't mind. Are you guys capable? Is the question. Don't worry, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm American and Palestinian and African American, and now Somali inspired. What days are you available? Um. I I don't want to do it so close. So how about Monday? Monday? I'm cool. No, not Monday. You want to do it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Yes, we could do that. We could do that. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So we've got a Wednesday class, and then Thursday and then Friday. Yeah. You guys are cool with that? I'm cool with that. We got it. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I can see Fatimata is uh, getting scared. Okay, well, okay, what's the you know, nighttime and then Okay. So you want it to be Monday? Yeah. Okay. No, no, when do we finish? When do we start? Yeah, when do we start? Exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, how about we be committed that we would end with Isha? How about that? Unless you want it to be on Saturday. Saturday? How about that? What time Saturday? I'm cool all day Saturday. I would just have to check with the message that way we won't have kids running around because I won't focus. I know that they probably end at 2 p.m. So if we were to start on Saturday at 3 p.m., we could probably finish at 5, and that way you guys could go home at 5 p.m. Hopefully. There you go. That's a good one. Um, how about that? I do the ICM third uh, thing at one, and that's bi weekly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, Saturday it is. Send me a reminder because I'm getting old. So are we doing Wednesday and uh, Saturday? Or yeah, we're Wednesday? doing Wednesday. So, Wednesday, the same Maghrib thingy. Okay. And then we got Friday, the same Maghrib. So basically the same timing that we're doing uh, the two hour now, okay. supposedly two hours, it goes into three hours. And then Saturday. Saturday. So I was starting okay. Saturday or That's a good one. Are we starting this Saturday? I'm willing to actually start tomorrow. So what, okay, what time does this start? At 3 p.m. Can we go a little later? A little yeah, later, like 4 p.m.? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So 4 p.m.? You want 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. Yeah. Evening is fine. <laughs> I know. Yes, no, I am. I mean, it's just for everyone. The same is fine because Saturday gets to yeah. in on Sunday. I think she's concerned about safety, which is really fair. Okay. What happened? Yeah, we're all together. Oh, well, that's it? Yeah. We do it already. Let's do it. Saturday? Saturday. Because we're going to sleep in Sunday. Okay. Try this one. Just watch. Same time. Same time. Aisha. You, it's okay for you to say this to me. I don't mind. Okay, so Saturday, 6 p.m.? All right, so this is it, inshallah. We'll see you tomorrow at 6 p.m. I have a question. Inshallah. Go ahead, my dear. Yep. And how we're in search of Bethlehem. Okay. How do you consider the evidences of the shed? Obviously, if you would trust them, right? But some of them use maqasid, and some of them use also... Everybody uses maqasid. There's no conflating. Okay, can I tell you a scenario? Uh, sure. Okay. I, I